We are live. Welcome to Shir Hashirim class number 45. We are studying the book of Songs of Songs. What did I call it? Songs of Songs? Song of Songs. We are at the end of chapter five. And we are um we are at the end of chapter five, and we're just about to finish pretty much. Okay, I see that Yitzchak is trying to join the live class. Yitzchak, if you can hear my voice, it's telling me that your devices are not connected. That means no camera and no microphone. And because you don't have any devices connected, I can't um, I can't connect you. Oh, there you are. Rab Yitzchak, you made it. Okay, you're able to hear me okay? I can see you now. You're muted, but that's okay. You can stay muted if you want to. As long as you give me a thumbs up, you can hear me, see me. See me, hear me. Okay, great. Awesome. We are going to dedicate tonight's class to um, the memory of my father-in-law, Alchanan Nachum Ben Yitzchak, whose yard site was this past week. And um, also want to give a shout out to the Seattle Kolel. Thank you to the Seattle Kolel for um, making this series possible. Uh, once again, seattlekolel.org. If anyone would like to um, contribute to the Seattle Kolel, that is their web address. And um, classes are free, but any contribution is welcome. Fine. We're going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen, if that's okay with everybody. Do, 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 do. Share screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to start here. I'm going to change the tab in a minute. Just uh, give me a... Oh, I have to put it on the screen still. <laughs> that's... Oh, hey, Ruby, it's like, there you are. Um, that's what I meant to put up. Okay, uh, thumbs up. I don't see anyone, so I can. I only see Yitzchak, but give me a thumbs up or a yes if you can see the text. Oh, people can see the text. Okay, no, now thumbs down. Okay. Uh, yes. Let me try again. Okay, there it is. Yes. Okay, we've got the text. Um. So now what we're seeing over here is these are the, the final verses in chapter five that we've been studying the past number of weeks, months, a long time we've been on this section. They were, these are very difficult verses. They were very hard to decipher, and we took our time with them. And now last week we ended off in the middle of verse 15. We did last time, Shokov Amude Sheish. His thighs are pillars of marble. This is, again, the woman who is Israel describing her beloved, which is God, and saying that his thighs are, are pillars of marble, al fuzz, that are founded upon, upon foundations of fine gold. And we talked about how each pillar has, a, has kind of a, I forgot what it's called. I keep forgetting what it's called, but it has kind of a, a socket on top that it fits into, which is ornate. And it has an ornate socket on the bottom. And um, these, these top and bottom represent the connections between sections of Torah, parshios of Torah, that each sm small section of Torah that in the Torah scroll might may be divided by a, a, a little section break. Um, you know, a little, you'll see a space in the text of the scroll uh, between one section and another, or even just a change of topics that the, the order and the positioning of each section, topic by topic in the Torah, the fact that two are connected on this end of the section, it's connected to the previous section. And at the end of the section, it's connected to the next section. Those connections are meant to teach us something. We're not just meant to read each section separate, but look, we'll ask the question, why did the Torah follow up this previous section with the one we're in now? What is what is the what is the ideological connection between these two? And we gave some examples of lessons we learn out from, from connecting two topics one to another in section order in the Torah. 
So we look at the one above and we look at what the one below and we learn lessons from there. And that's like the, 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 the golden sockets in which these marble pillars are, are founded. So we, we paused at that point because we were out of time. Now we're going to finish up. It says, Mar Ehu Kalavanon. His appearance is like Lebanon. Uh, and the end of the verse is Bahur Ka'arazim, choice like cedars. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice like cedars. Okay, any comments or questions before we before we go on? If you have any, oh Rabbi Yaakov, welcome. I see you, Rabbi Yaakov. Yes, I finally got here. Okay, oh. you, didn't, you didn't miss anything. We just did a little recap. Okay. Happy to have you. Happy to be here. All righty then. <laughs> um, so, okay. So now we're gonna get into the commentary. I'm gonna I'm gonna take off this slide. I'm gonna put up another one uh, that I have pre-loaded, so I don't have to scroll all the way down. So let's get that other one up there. Let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Do 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 do. Bear with me. And. Okay. Should be able to see that. Let me know if you're not seeing it. Um, okay. So what it says over here in the text is. His appearance is like Lebanon. Says Rashi the following: One who looks carefully and contemplates his words, meaning the Torah's words, he will find in them flowers and lulavim. Now we all know the word lulav as connected with the branch of the of the palm tree that we we use on the holiday of Sukkot. We wave the lulav branch, right? The the palm frond. You, a, a lulav is a frond, right? But a, a lulav in a broader context, it, it means kind of like a growth, a, a, a budding or sprouting or branching of a plant. So in other words, in other words, his his appearance is like Lebanon. What was Leb what is Lebanon essentially? It's a forest. Lebanon is a forest of cedar trees, of white cedar wood. And it was, these were the, the, the Arze Levanon, the cedars of Lebanon. So when we talk about Levanon, Lebanon, we're talking about a forest of trees, a, a mighty forest of, of trees. So if you look at a forest from a distance, you, you, you just see a big forest. You know, they talk about losing the forest for the trees. They say, don't lose the forest for the trees. But here we want to say, don't lose the trees for the forest. Because you look and you see a forest. It, it doesn't have fine details. You just know there's, there's a whole lot of trees. I just see a whole lot of green, a whole lot of trees there. But it says, now look close. Go zoom in. Zoom in. And you'll see it's not just trees. You get close and you see the individual branches. And you see that the, the large trunks break off into, into smaller trunks which break off into smaller branches which break off into smaller branches which each carry different leaves of different sizes and different flowers blossoms blossoming and buds the closer you look the more you find more and more fine details and beautiful uh beautiful attributes of the trees so that's the comparison to the Levano, the Levano, the Lebanon, is that when we look now, I want to I want to just digress a little bit. Uh, our friend Yaakov, who's in the class right now, pointed out to us that in his translation or one of the translations that he was looking at during one of the classes, all this is being the al the allegory here is all being explained as describing the Torah. Right. And I said we're describing Hashem when we talk about the the beloved, the woman's beloved is Hashem. But yet, it's certainly true that through all these verses, we've been really describing different aspects of the Torah, if you remember all the classes we've been doing. So are we talking about Hashem or are we talking about the Torah? Which one is it? So to, to answer what might be an obvious question, 
Hashem's appearance, Hashem's revelation to us, what He reveals to us about Himself, if you will, is the Torah. You may, you may say in a certain way that the Torah is the mind of God. The Torah is God's intellect revealed. So such that that would seem to be impossible because how could you encamp, encapsulate something infinite into something finite? And yet when we examine the Torah, we find that the Torah is also infinite. We spoke about the, 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 the points on the letters. And for each point, I'll call koits for koits for each one of the points. Tile tilem shal halachos. There are mounds upon mounds of teachings that come out, and there's teachings in the connections, and there's with there's the flat stomach with the with the with the sapphires. You know, it looks smooth, but you look close and you see all these little diktukim. There's all the the, the, the hermeneutical, um, with, um, uh, what do you call hermeneutical? Um, I'm missing the word, but approaches that we use to to extract and expound more teachings we can find in this slab of ivory the little beads of of sapphires that are in there and in the wheels of gold you see these tablets the two tablets with the five um declarations on each one and yet between each one we said was there was they there was it was like big waves and small waves why were they called um gilile zahav why were they called gililim of gold? From the word galim, which is waves. And the gililim are small waves. So the, the, the declarations on the tablets were the big waves, but in between them were small waves. What are the small waves? All 613 commandments. Mamula and Batarshish. The, the golden, the golden uh, gililim, as it were, were inlaid with, with many, many Tarshish stones. And we said Tarshish was a hint to Taryag, the 613 commandments. So we find there's the broad picture, but you look more closely and you see more. And there's this sort of crystalline structure. There's, um, what is that called? I gave a whole class on this. It was in the series. It looked like class number 20. I don't remember what it was. What is it called? A fractal. There's a, the Torah has a fractal pattern, right? Well, what's a fractal? It's like you, you you see a certain shape and then you zoom in and you realize that that shape is made up of more of the identical shapes. And then you zoom in on those and you see that there's smaller of the same shapes making that one up and you go smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's just more and more and more of this same pattern, like a crystal or a snowflake, a crystalline pattern is a fractal pattern. The Torah is fractal. It, it, it has a certain form, but when you zoom in, you can see that it's comprised of, of more. And then you zoom in and it's comprised of more. Um, Cliff said class 46, question mark. And I said it was class 45. Did I say 46 or 45? Um, I thought it was, I thought we're up to 45. Am I wrong? Okay. I'm probably wrong. I don't know. I, I thought you said 45 last week. That's I might have, and I might have been wrong last week too. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why. I think. No biggie. <laughs> I could check, but I don't want whatever. No, no, no. I was just uh, 40 something. Okay. <laughs> whatever class we're up to. So, uh, but thank, but thank you for bringing it to my attention. So we see a certain form, but we look closely and we see more detail and you zoom in again and you see more detail and more and more and more and more and more. So that's like the Levano, like, like the forest. Is you see trees, but you zoom in and you see the branches, and you zoom in and you see the branches and branches, and you zoom in and you see more and more and more and more and more, right? And then you could even add on here. You look at a leaf and it has like a branching pattern in it, and then you zoom in more and you see the branches and branches of the the different, uh, you know, like um, veins of the leaf, as it were. And it's true in biology, right? You zoom in and you find cells, and you zoom into the cell and you see all these structures inside the cell and you zoom into the nucleus and you find the DNA and you zoom in and you see these proteins and you zoom in and you know, you find uh, the smallest, you find it at the atoms and in the atoms are the particles and in the particles are the sub sub particles and so on and so forth. Right. It just goes further and further and further. So in a certain way, yes, the creation itself is a revelation of God's wisdom. That's why the, 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 the prophets exhort over and over, look into the creation and you will see a revelation of God. And even who was it? Anthony Flew, I think. Anthony Flew, one of these very, very old staunch atheists who used to, uh, he used to mock, 
He used to mock uh, religious believers. He mocked people who believed in uh, design and creation and and all that. And he was, you know, convinced by by evolution and and all this stuff. And then once they discovered the genome, and then they started looking deeper into the genome. They found more patterns and they looked deeper and they found more patterns. And the deeper they went, the more patterns upon patterns they found at a certain point, Anthony flew in his eighties in his eighties after a, a career as a, as an outspoken militant atheist, he recanted, he recanted his atheism. And he said, as a scientist, I have to admit the evidence of my eyes. It is absolutely unreasonable to hold on to a belief that that the universe and life itself was not designed when we find obvious proof of of uh of intellect deep intellect beyond our wildest dreams in in the patterns of nature so th there was a person who was intellectually and honest enough to admit it because he said you just you look deeper and deeper and you find more and more wisdom so it shouldn't be it shouldn't be that way. We didn't we didn't expect that at all. Even Darwin, when he invented the theory of evolution, he thought the cell was just like a blob of protoplasm. He had no idea that the cell was comprised of of all kinds of intricate machinery inside of it. He had no he, that was none of that was discovered yet. He thought the cell was something very very simple. Had he known what the cell was, what a single cell was. I don't think he ever would have proposed that a single cell could arise from nothing. So, Rabbi, yeah, how do you spell that guy's name? Anthony Flew, is it? It's a good question. So Anthony is Anthony, right? Even right. He's, he's British, so his name is pronounced Anthony, but it's spelled Anthony. And Flu is either F-L-U, like the flu, influenza, right. or F-L-E-W, like flu the coop. But I'm not sure. So you look it up. Um, yeah, I want to look him up. Uh, anyway, if I'm not getting the name wrong, and and he's probably not alone. I, I think he's not the only person who flipped on this. But um, anyway, but the Torah is the same way. The, to the Torah is the blueprint of the world. So whatever we find in the world, we should expect to find that there's a root in the blueprint. So that's what's being described here in Shira Shirim is this revelation of the infinity of God where we see God and we see his beauty and we see his brilliance and we see his magnificence. The magnificence is in the Torah which he revealed. So that's why all these descriptions of God are really description of the revelation of his mind, if you will, which is through the Torah and it's, it's, it's infinite. So it's like a forest. You it looks like just like a blob of trees, but you go in and you see more details and more details and more details and more details. It's the parallel of sort of nature, the, the infinite intricacy of nature to the infinite intricacy of the Torah. And all that is a revelation of the infinity of God. I can't resist but mention an anecdote. So the, in, in, in science, right, there are, um, there are scientists who, um, who put forward the idea of intelligent design. And there are scientists that, are against the belief of, intel of intelligent design, that everything came through naturalistic causes, right? And we don't have to identify who the individual personalities are, but they have debates and whatever. Um, I'm not even talking about like young earth creationists that are that are holding fast to a literal reading of the Bible and and basing their scientific conclusions on that. I mean, I, and I'm not and I'm not either knocking on their legitimacy because some of them are very well papered. But I'm saying even in the more mainstream of uh, people who, who accept more of the conclusions of modern science, but nevertheless see their evidence of intelligent design, of a, of a higher intellect. So um, in one of the speeches that I heard from the anti-intelligent design camp, who is trying to cut down the intelligent design argument, and I don't remember who it was who said this. He said, he gets up in front of like an audience full of atheists. You know, he's preaching to the choir. <laughs> and he says, I would like to sum up every single scientific presentation by an intelligent design um, advocate. It basically goes like this. Complexity, 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 complexity. There, that's it. Harumph. 
He's like, look, I reduced it to one word, complexity. Yeah, I could also say complexity. Is that all you got? All you got is to say complexity, 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 complexity. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, that's it. Do you have a rebuttal? <laughs> Do you, yeah, you're right. You boiled it all down to one word. Do you have a rebuttal for this? And they try, but ultimately, ultimately their their rebuttals fall flat. Again, in my opinion, I'm not I'm not a scientist, so I, I, I'm not an authority. No one should take what I say on the subject as authoritative. You know, uh, there's a story there's a story about Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs of uh, blessed memory that he was at a conference of like science and religion or something, and the person who got up to speak was I forgot who it was. It's in a a famous astronomer whose last name is Jastro, right? So he's Jewish, not religious, and probably a descendant of the of the famous Marcus Jastro, the famous Rabbi Marcus Jastro, who wrote the um, incredible uh, Jastro Dictionary of the Talmud, which uh, is just a phenomenal tool. He himself, you know, was a, of a generation that kind of teetered between tradition and modernity. And it's hard to identify whether he was an Orthodox rabbi or a conservative rabbi or a Reconstructionist rabbi because th these movements were nascent at that time. Obviously not Orthodoxy, but the alternatives to orthodox Orthodoxy were somewhat nascent at that time. And many of the Talmud Chacham and many of the Torah scholars of that day uh, had like a foot here and a foot there. And it's only through the prism of history that we can see, like, who who was really ultimately in which camp. And I, I could talk a lot about that, but it's not our topic. But anyway, the original rabbi, Marcus Jastrow, was such a person that, you know, he, he may have identified somewhat with orthodoxy, but also we could look at some of his ideas as already moving beyond orthodoxy to something more progressive. But be that as it may, he was a huge scholar. He wrote an incredible dictionary of the Talmud and Targumim, that is the Aramaic translations of the, of the books of the Bible, and it's an ex extremely useful tool for Torah scholars today. Rabbi, um, can I, can I uh, interrupt for a second? Yes. Okay. I have two, two brief comments. One of them is an anecdote um, attributed to Albert Einstein. Yes, go ahead. And Einstein was, Einstein spent the last 30 or 40 years of his life, searching for what he called the unified field theory. And he could never quite get there. He never got there. And he was asked at one point, if you're trying this hard and you're not there, how do you know it exists? And Einstein's response was, God doesn't roll dice with the universe. I, I've heard that before. I've heard that before. That is. Yeah, thank you. What, what was just, your other comment? Okay. The other comment was that when you were talking about uh, going further and further into the details, I was once asked, when does Talmud end? And I said, it doesn't, because we're always adding to it. And what we're adding to it is going further and further and further into details. Right, right. Well, so to speak, what we're adding to it, the, 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 the commentaries and super commentaries are really just delving deeper into the text and revealing more that's there. Yeah. Uh, very true. And that, that's really exactly what's being communicated here. Um, but the anecdote I was going to say about this, there was this astronomer, Jastro, whose first name I don't remember. He gets up to speak and he says, uh, I'm not a theologian, but I think religion can be summed up by the following idea. And he goes on to s talk about his view on religion. <laughs> so then Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs gets up and he goes, I'm not an astronomer, but I believe astronomy could be summed up by the following. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Right? <laughs> so he says, if you're not, if you're not a theologian, what, what, of what weight, of what value is your opinion on religion? You, you, you have no expertise in it. It's not your study. So that's like me coming along as a rabbi and telling you what astronomy is. Anyway, so I say that I say that to knock myself down a notch. That 
I like science. I'm I'm interested in science. I I have a lot of thoughts on it. I have a lot to say on it, but I'm by no means um, a, 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 I have no degree in it. So I'm not. I don't speak as an authority. I'm just I'm just sharing. I'm just sharing kind of my own uh, musings. That's just with that caveat. Anyway, so that's the forest. Okay. Um. Right. If a person he looks and he contemplates the words of the Torah, which are God's words, he finds in them flowers and lulavim again, like branches and blossoms. Like this forest, here he's just I just spoke it out. Like this forest, shemilavlev. You see the verb milavlev from the word lulav that it's sprouting and branching. Kach divre Torah. So to the words of Torah, hahogevahem tamid. A person who contemplates them constantly, mechadesh bahem te'amim. This is what, what Rabbi Yaakov just said. He's able to discover new te'amim. We learned this before that ta'am in Hebrew means taste. We talked about ta'am Torah in the previous class where we talked about um, the lips dripping with honey and uh, the idea that the, the words of Torah are... Are uh, are delicious in that they have ta'am, and we said it has a dual meaning, not just delicious taste, but ta'am also means intellectual reason. Aside from we said that the music of the Torah is called ta'amim, the cantillation of the Torah are called flavors, ta'amim, taste, but but ideas and explanations of the Torah are also called ta'amim, tastes flavors so a person you learn torah you can find more and more novel torah ideas what we call chidushe torah novel torah ideas that are rooted in the torah but they've just never been discovered before until some new person came along and contemplated it and discovered an idea that had never been expressed before so we can find more and more ta'amim more and more explanations ideas concepts being revealed from the Torah constantly. Okay. Uh, Bachur, we said, Bachur uh, ka'arazim, choice like cedars. Nivchar ka'arazim ha'nivcharim levinyan u'lechozek logova. It is choice. It's like a choice forest, like a forest of cedar trees, which are the choicest for building and for strength and for height. Cedars are tall, cedars are strong, cedars are, are ideal for building, and that's why the Torah is compared to a, far, fa, a forest, but for the reason we said, but not just any forest, but a forest of cedars, because just as the cedars are the choicest of wood, the Torah is the choicest type of uh, item of its nature, right? It, it, if it's going to be compared to a forest, it's going to be compared only to the, the greatest and choicest type of a forest. Okay. That is the end of verse 15. Uh, and now we get to the last verse. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to change the, the slide back to the, to the other one uh, so that we can so that we can see the verse. So bear with me while I do that. Switching back. Okay, now uh, I need to make it visible. Okay, here we go. You should be able to see it now. And we're looking at verse 16, the last verse in the chapter. You ready to finish? That means... Chiko mamtakim, his palate is sweet, right? Matok in Hebrew means sweet. Mamtakim means like sweet delicacies. His palate is sweet delicacies. Vechulo machamadim, and all of him is precious. Machamadim is plural. It's like all of him is precious stuff. Zedodi. This is my beloved, Vizerei, and this is my friend. Again, a reya is a friend, but it means like a close friend. Um, uh, just to, to just to explain, like the idea of a, of a reya being a close friend. You know, my, my rabbi of Daniel Belsky Shlita, he said 
you know, you have a word for a friend like Chavir, and then you have a word for a friend like Reya, like Ve'ahavta Reya Chakamocha. You should love your Reya like yourself. And it's strange for the Torah to use the word Reya. I'm going on a tangent, but the word Reya is spelled the same as the word Ra in Hebrew. And what does the word Ra mean? The word Ra means evil, evil, or bad, right? So why is the word ra, which is evil, similar to the word reya? And you could ask this on a lot of things like roe, a shepherd, as we're going to see. W what is the connection between these things? So listen to this brilliant insight into Hebrew. Just to put a little sauce on it. If something is shaky, like you have a ladder and it's not integrated well, and it's shaky, in Hebrew, the word for, the, for that is Ra'ua, Ra'ua, with the same letters, Resh Ayin for Ra, and the U vowel, and another Ayin, because it's diminutive. Ra'ua, it's shaky, but what does that have to do with being evil, and what does it do with Reya, a friend? Listen to this brilliant insight. He said, Ra and Reya means that which is missing. That which is missing. Think of it this way. Hashem created the world and he did so by only by, in other words, I'll say it differently. God is, is everything. Hashem Echad, God is one. The idea of God is one. It's not just that there's one God, but there is nothing other than him. Ain od mil vado, the Torah says. There's nothing other than God. Everything that we see is somewhat of an illusion. It is The fact that there can be a world that appears to be independent of God is because we are, our eyes are in some way blinded to seeing God's full revelation. And because there's, there's blockages in our vision, we don't see the full picture. So we're seeing pieces of infinity, but we're not seeing the full infinity. If we would see the full infinity, there would be no division between anything. We wouldn't, we wouldn't distinguish a world. We would just experience God in his infinity. So to create the world, God concealed, he concealed his infinite essence. So what we're seeing is only partial revelation, but there's missing pieces. So what's missing is Ra. When we see evil in the world, when there's, how, and people ask the question, how could there be bad in a world that is, that is, uh, created by or overseen by managed by supervised by a good all-powerful god if god is all this is the great philosophical question of theodicy if god is all-powerful and god is all-knowing and god is all benevolent then he knows of the existence of evil he's able to stop the evil he wants to stop the evil right he can stop but he but he doesn't doesn't make any sense so the, therefore, the, the problem of the Odyssey presents that there's either no God or God is not all-knowing. He doesn't know about evil. Otherwise, he'd get rid of it. Or he's not omnipotent. He's not able to get rid of evil. This is Harold Kushner's thesis in Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People, which is a heretical book, and no, no one should, should subscribe to it. Um, but it's popular. It was written by a so-called rabbi, but we, we don't accept his beliefs. Um, or that God is not so benevolent as we think he's not good so he he could take it away and he's able he wants he knows about it but he doesn't care right you you they say you can't have all three and yet there also be evil so without going in there and now i'm going to tease that and not give a solution i mean the short answer is because part of the process of good is that we have to overcome it that's that's a topic for another class that it's a process but um, and we're partners in that process, so there has to be, uh, there has to be that potentiality, so that we can rectify it. That's our mission. But that aside, right? The idea is the fact that we see evil in the world is because there is a blockage in the revelation of God's infinity, right? So Ra is that which is missing. It's the missing piece of revelation. That's where we see Ra. But like we spoke about, not oh, in my Parsha class this week on Tanakh Talk, we talked about the idea of um, everything God does is for the good. It means even the bad that we see is is 
is really good, just we that we can't see that it is. We can't see God's good there. So we have to have faith that it is for an ultimate good purpose, which it is. But that's the idea. Ra is that which is missing. That which is missing. It's a it's an absence of God's revelation. So Raya, my beloved friend, you know what my Raya is? Is that person who's missing from my life. Without that person, I am incomplete. That is the person that makes me whole. That's my Raya. That's my Raya. That's what I'm missing. When I say that you're my Raya, I'm saying you're you are what I'm missing. Isn't that incredible insight? So the latter that's Raua, it's shaky because it's not. It's not solidified together. It has gaps, right? It's not integrated into a single whole. There's missing pieces. The screw is loose, whatever it is, right? Ra'ua, something's missing. Okay. Ze dodi vezerei. Dodi, this is my beloved vezerei, and this is my, what you might just translate as my beloved friend, but meaning my the, that one who is, who is the one I am missing? When we talk about the love your fellow as yourself, we talk about loving your fellow as yourself. It's because the Jewish people is meant to be one whole. The Jewish people is meant to be one whole. So we talk about you have to look at your fellow Jew as your missing piece, as a link in the chain. That if you we would if we would reject this person, then we are not whole. So we have to embrace. That's the idea of a haftala reacha kamocha. What if he's not such a good friend of mine? Why am I calling him Rea? Now you may not realize it, but the Jewish people have to look at one another as one unit. And if I'm not linked with this person, there's something missing. Fine. So this is my beloved and this is my Rea, my beloved friend, or that missing piece of myself. Benos Yerushalayim, O daughters of Jerusalem. So... I, all I did was translate. That was just the translation. We didn't even do the commentary. Now we're going to look at the commentary. Before we look at the commentary, which is brief relatively. I don't know how to be brief, but potentially brief. Um, any questions or comments on what I've said until now? I was just thinking, can I say something? Go ahead. That's what I invited you to. <laughs> um, I get frustrated with people sometimes especially like missionaries um when i see some of the things that they write and but i was i saw something today on habad i think it was that um if we think about that if it's just ourself and god in the world and everyone else in the world is a piece of God or is God that we're looking at, then that gives us a different perspective on who we're dealing with. And anyways, I, I, it was just like, wow, that's a new thought. Yeah. That maybe I can be more kind when I'm dealing with people. Certainly, um, and and it's, that's not easy to do. That's not easy to do. In fact, if we get into chapter six, we're gonna. I was gonna talk about about missionaries a little bit, but um, we'll see how far we get. Okay. Yep. So, uh, yeah. Can I can I go ahead? Sure. Okay. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. Uh, looking here at the commentary, okay, Chikomam Takim, it starts off by saying that his palate is sweet stuff, right? So Rashi says, Dvarov Arevim, his words are pleasant, his words are sweet, his words are delicious, God's words are delicious, his palate, right? The palate, that part of the mouth that we use to enunciate our words is the source of delicious words that he says, such as, listen to this. Viseret la nefesh lo sitinu bivsarchem. There's a verse in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28. It says, You shall not put a, a blade upon your flesh for the for la nefesh for a soul. That means that there was an idolatrous practice that as a mourning ritual, someone would die. 
the relatives would cut themselves. They would cut themselves as a sign of mourning. So we're forbidden to do that. We're forbidden to show excessive mourning, and this because it shows lack of faith in the eternity of the soul, that we have to mourn somewhat. And, and I know some of you are aware, Rabbi Wallerstein spoke about this topic of why do we mourn for people who pass on? It's because of the loss of potential. While they're in this world, they have the potential. And I spoke about this myself because I, I'm, a, I'm a student of the Wallerstein family. Um, I heard this from Rabbi Penchus Wallerstein actually first. But because as long as we're in this world, we can make a difference. We can make a difference for the world. We can make a difference for ourselves. And really, each one of those is the same. When I change myself, I change the world. When I change the world, I'm changing myself. You know, uh, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter had a had a great saying, and I'm going to botch it. But I I think I think because I, 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 I didn't prepare it. This is kind of off the cuff. But he said something like. Um, I spent most of my life trying to change the world. Then I realized I couldn't change the world. So I tried to change my, you know, maybe say like my country. Then I realized I couldn't change my country. So I tried to change my city. I couldn't change my city. So I tried to change my community. I couldn't change my community. So I tried to change my family. I couldn't change my family. So I realized I can only change myself. And then he said, and if I had if I had started with that, if I'd spent most of my life changing myself, I probably could have changed my family, then my community, then my country, and then the, you know, then my city, then my country, and then the world. I'm not saying exactly right, but it's something like along those lines that really the only one we can change is ourselves. But when we are changing ourselves, we really are changing. The whole world on the one hand, because we're a part of the world and like they say, be the change you want to see in the world. Well, exactly. Once we change ourselves, we we brought the change into the world that we wanted, you know, starting with the man in the mirror, as they say. But but you really can't influence another until you yourself work on a certain thing. You know, you can't give over to someone something you don't have. And also. It's not really effective to tell people as much as it's effective to lead by example. You know, it doesn't work to say, do as I say, but not as I do. So anyway, why did I say that? I said that because, because, the, because of mourning, right? We mourn because of the loss of potential, but we don't excessively mourn because it would indicate like somehow we feel like this person is lost forever. And that's not the case because there's an eternity of the soul and the person is connected to God, and they're, so to speak, in a better place. So we have to balance between the mourning and the recognition that this person lives on in a better place. So we can't mourn excessively. And among the forbidden acts is, is cutting our flesh in mourning for the dead. So, so it says in the Torah, don't put cuts into your flesh. Ani Hashem, I am God. What does it mean, I am God? So bear with me where I'm going with this. What? Why does many commandments end with I am God? I am God. Okay, you told me already. I think I don't know who you are yet. So the idea, I am God, Ani Hashem. The name Hashem in Hebrew is spelled Yud and He and Vav and He, which is a contraction uh, of three words. Haya, Hove, Yihia. Was, is, will be. It's a way of expressing the eternality of God. God is in all places at all times. So why does he say that name when he gives a commandment? So Rashi tells us, Hane'emon l'shalim sachar. You could, I am faithful to repay reward. I've said this before in, in my uh, prayer series. I am faithful to pay reward. Just like I, I commanded you to do something and you're doing it now, I'm going to be... I'm going to be there at the finish line to give you a reward. So have faith in me. It's like almost like God's begging you to do a hard thing. I know it's hard to do, but trust me, it's worth your while. And even though it's hard now, I'm in the infinite God. I'm going to be there at the end to make sure you see the just desserts of your actions. So take it on faith and, and, and go through with what I'm asking you to do. So Rashi says, look at God asks us to say, ready guys, I'm going to give, it's going to be a hard one, 
but do it for me. Do it because I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pay you a lot of reward. I'm gonna pay you a lot of reward. It'll be worth it for you. Okay, and you're like, oh my gosh, what's he gonna ask me to do? You know, with such a prelude, he says, don't cut yourself up. Don't take a knife and chop up your body. Okay, and we're sitting there thinking like, I was gonna do that. I was gonna do. I was gonna mutilate myself. I, why would I? That's crazy for me to go and chop myself into pieces. So God says. The commandments I'm giving you are so easy. And they're not just easy. They're so benevolent. All I'm telling you to do is take care of yourself. <laughs> right? Imagine God says, here's what commandment. Go take a hot bath. Put some, uh, you know, whatever, the bubbles in there to have a good time. Here, here's a gift certificate. Go to a spa. Right? Go to a spa. Please, I'm begging you. And I'll pay you to do it. I'm like, are you good? That's too bad. I who doesn't want to do that, right? It's like, you don't need to pay me for that. But God says, I'm going to give you a commandment. I command you not to harm yourself. I command you to be good to yourself. I command you to take care of yourself. I command you to love yourself. And I know how hard that is, so I'm going to pay you for it. And don't worry, I'll, I'm I'm faithful to pay. It's like, the, this is the most benevolent God that his commandments to us are just for our benefit. They're pleasant to do, and he's going to pay us to do it, right? He's going to pay us to do it. Here is a bowl of ice cream. You go to the ice cream store. You pay five, ten dollars for a few scoops of ice cream, right? Okay, it's worth it for the enjoyment. God says, here's a bowl of ice cream, and I'll pay you ten dollars to eat it, right? So what an unbelievable God. So it says Rashi, Yesh Chek Masok Mizeh. Is there a sweeter palate than this? Have you ever heard sweeter words in your life? How sweet are the words of God that all he does is tell us to do delicious commandments that are enjoyable and beneficial for us. And, and then he says, and I'll also pay you for it. Could there be a sweet, sweeter words to hear than that? That's what it means. Chiko mamtakim. His, his palate is sweet. His palate is sweet because he speaks sweet, delicious commandments and he promises reward for them. Unbelievable. Here, so Rashi goes on. Don't abuse yourselves. Usikabalu, scrolling down. Usikabalu Sachar, and you'll receive reward for that. Here's another one. Uvashuv Rasha Mirashasao. And when a wicked person turns away from his evil, the Asa Mishpatutstaka. And he does justice and righteousness. He shall live by them. So number one, without even Rashi's commentary, he's just quoting a verse in Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 11, where he says that if a wicked person will, will turn away from his wicked ways and do righteousness, he shall live by that. Meaning, I, I won't kill him. I won't punish the wicked, so to speak, for his wickedness if he repents. You might say, what's done is done. For his wickedness, he needs to be given punishment. Okay, for his justice, he'll get reward. Okay, but God is saying, turn away from your wickedness and you'll live. Meaning, that wickedness will not be counted against you. I'll erase it. I'll erase it. Unbelie you could be wicked and God gives you the remedy to... to, to eliminate the penalty for your wickedness. But not only that, what Rashi is about to add is even deeper because our rabbis see here, Aleihem hu yechyeh, he will live by them. He will live by what? Not just the justice and righteousness, but everything in the verse. He'll turn away from his wickedness and he'll do justice and righteousness. He'll live by them. He'll live by all of it. The wickedness and the justice and the righteousness shall all cause him to live. How? It's the justice and righteousness that's causing him to live, not the wickedness. So look at Rashi's words. This is a Gemara in uh, Tractate Yuma 86b, I think. And it says, Avonos nechshavu lo l'schuyos. His sins will be rendered to him as merits. That if a person does teshuva the proper way, and we can examine the Talmudic passage for more detail, but a person does repentance in the proper way, even his sins become retroactively rendered for him 
as merits. So by all of these, he'll live. He'll be given eternal life. He'll be given eternal life of the soul reward in the next world for not just his justice and righteousness, but even from the wickedness that he did, he'll be rewarded when he turns away from it in the proper way. Is there a sweeter palate than this? Have you ever heard sweeter words in your life? Takim says, says the Shiro Shiram. His palate is full of sweet things. Everything God says to me is sweet. And here are some examples. Don't abuse yourself and I'll reward you for it. If you repent from your sins, I'll reward you even for your sins. So here is um here, there, there's a, there's, here's, I quoted another verse in Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 27 and 28, a very similar verse, and some of the Malbum's commentary on that, which is illuminating. But I think we'll go straight to the source, which is this passage from the Talmud in tractate Yuma 86b, where it says this, Amar Reish Lakish, Reish Lakish said, Gedola Teshuva, great is Teshuva, great is repentance, that his willful sins will be rendered as accidental sins, so to speak. Now, when we say accidental sins, we don't mean that you, um, you know, like the example I give, you know, you slipped in the kitchen and you turned the stove on and, uh, you know, and fried an egg on Shabbos, right? That was, you, that was completely unintentional. A uh, shigaga, when we say it's really a ne a sin done through negligence, which means that uh, you were frying the egg, and then somebody walks in the room and says, "Why are you cooking on Shabbos?" And you go, "Oh, it's Shabbos, I forgot." So you should have been more thoughtful. You knew it was you weren't supposed to do that on Shabbos, but you didn't think in the moment, "Am I supposed to be doing this right now?" So that's your own negligence, and a person is liable to that to a certain degree. To a certain degree, not to the same degree as intentional, but still requires atonement, requires repentance, requires atonement. So a person, says Reish Lakish, who commits a willful sin, the willful sin becomes like a um, sin through negligence. It's it's taken down, it's taken down a, not, a notch. Uh, and therefore, the, the, the atonement becomes lesser. I can more easily atone for it um when i do go through a certain process of teshuva shenamar as it says in this verse which i forgot to put the citation for uh but it's in hoshea somewhere and i don't remember exactly where it is in hoshea it says shuva yisrael ad hashem alokecha return o israel until hashem your god ki choshalta ba'avonecha because you have stumbled in your iniquity now, this is a contradiction because stumbling stumbling implies accidental. When you stumble, it's accidental. But an avon, and an, an avon means a willful sin. So you have stumbled in your willful sin. What do you mean you've stumbled in your willful sin? If it was willful, you didn't stumble. If you stumbled, it wasn't willful. So he, from here, the rabbis learn, Shuva ad Hashem elokecha. Return to God and what? God will render your iniquity, your avon, your willful sin, as a stumbling, as an Unwillful sin. That's what we learned from this verse in Hosea. That's what Rish Lakish is saying. Right? And the, the, the Talmud really says, Ha avon mezidhu. Avon means willful. Vikakari le michshal. Yet it's called stumbling. Eini, how is this? Uh, and it's called stumbling. Okay? Conclusion is that the willful sin is knocked down a notch to be considered a sin through only negligence. Through the process of repentance. Now the Gemara asks on this immediately. Ini, is this so? Lakish, but Reish Lakish also said something else which which seems contradictory. Gedola Teshuva, Shazidonos Nasos Lo Kishuyos. Great is repentance that his willful sins become merits, right? That's what Rashi said in his commentary. He quoted this. His willful sins become merits through Teshuva. Now, how could Reish Lakish have said both? One says the willful sins will become unwitting sins and the other one says it'll become a merit that's not the same merit means like a like a as though we performed a, a positive act shenamar as it says uveshuv rasha mirisha so here's that verse from here's that verse from uh ezekiel when the wicked one will repent from his wickedness 
and he does justice and righteousness, he shall live by them, right? He shall live even by his wickedness, shall be a source of life for, for his soul. So this is a contradiction. So here the Gemara answers, Lokasha, no contradiction, kan me ahava, kan me ira. One is talking about teshuva of done me ahava, done from love. And one is talking about teshuva done from fear, right? One is, oi, I did a sin. I'm going to get punished for this. Uh, and I don't want to get punished for this. God, please forgive me. That's a lower level of teshuva. And all it does is it knocks it down to the level of, okay, I'll render it as a lower level sin. There'll be a smaller atonement necessary. But uh, if a person does teshuva out of love, not because of, I'm at regard for myself and what's going to happen to me if I don't uh, repent. But regard for God, I love you so much, Hashem. And I'm so sorry for having done something against you. I can't believe how awful I acted in this relationship where you've been so loving to me and I was so rotten. I feel so terrible for the way I acted towards you. Please forgive me. I love you and I'm sorry because of what I did to you, not because of what's going to happen to me. And when a person repents of love, then it that process is so healthy. And that process brings a person to such a high spiritual state that retroactively it takes everything along that process and flips it to, into a positive. And that's like what we said, again, in my Parsha class this week on Tanakh, Tanakh Talk, that there are bad things that we, we, we have to look at and say, this too is for the good. And God also looks at it that way, that we our own evil acts can become, if if they become for the good, then they are seen retroactively as good. Now, I want to put a caveat on that, that a rabbi say that if a person says, oh, no problem, so I'll just sin and then I'll repent, right? It sounds like that's the formula for success. I'll do what I want. I'll have the best of both worlds. Then I'll repent and I'll I'll be rewarded for it. The rabbi say, Ein must speak in chuva. such a person is not given the opportunity for repentance. That is a very big problem, and it's sort of, you can't break the rules like that, you know? If the genie gives you a wish, you can't wish for more wishes. It doesn't work. So the rabbi said that doesn't work, so I'm just adding that caveat. It's only if it naturally occurs that way, so to speak, organically occurs that way. You can't plan it out that way. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't work. Okay, let's finish up. It's the end of the hour. So that's just to give some depth over here when Rashi talks about the sweet palate of God and he quotes this verse from Ezekiel and it says that the, the sins are transformed into merits. That's just the context of where that comes from. Um, so that's the end of Rashi's comments on the verse, but it's not the end of the verse. So let's just read the end of the verse and uh, offer any closing thoughts. Um, yeah, in order for me to do that, I have to go back to the other tab. While I switch tab if, tabs, if there's any comments, you may make them um and we're going to try to finish up right now hey rabbi uh, whenever you can would you repeat you said something about leviticus something something i quoted a verse in leviticus where it's for it says it's forbidden to cut your flesh um yeah. in mourning do you want that citation? Uh, no, I just needed the Leviticus. It was what was the chapter? I yeah, I it was. It was. Let me look again. Chapter nineteen, verse twenty-eight. Chapter All nineteen, right. verse twenty-eight. Thank you. Got it. Uh, here we have the. We're back in the text. The last few words are over here, right? His his palate is sweet, and he is. All precious. Rashi doesn't offer any commentary there. Uh, and you could just say that's sort of like the sum up. We went through all the body parts already. Went through the hair and the eyes and the cheeks and the mouth. And the, we went through it all, right? So then finally we close up with the palate. And then we say, everything is precious. Um, but I wanted to offer I wanted to offer the Targum. The, the way the Targum, the Aramaic translation over there, says the following. Uh, rather than switch back slides again, I'll just read it to you. The Targum, the Aramaic translation, says this here. Um, when he translates the words, 
Here it says, Mile Morigoi Misikan Kedusha. The words of his palate are sweet like honey. Bechol Pikoi Doi Ragigon Al Chakimoi Midahav Uchsaf. That means, and all, when it says, and he is all precious, it says, and all of his commandments are precious to his wise ones like gold and silver. Okay? So, with this, I was wondering, why does he specify they're precious to the wise ones? So I thought, may, I have more than one thought on this, but I'll tell you the shorter thought because we're out of time. My shorter thought is that there are some command, like, let's be honest. There are some commandments that, like Rashi gives the examples, that are very sweet to hear and it's very easy to do. And the fact that God's going to reward us for that is like, you know, uh, it's the cherry on top, right? But there are also commands that are that are genuinely hard to do um, and do take a lot of self-control and self-sacrifice. So those ones we would not look at as sweet necessarily. So here when we say, then all of them, even the ones that we cannot discern as sweet, are still, we acknowledge that they are precious. And that's why the Targum adds in, they're precious to his wise ones. Because those who are wise to see, understand how beneficial they are, even when it's not obvious. So, mm -hmm. yes, he does have words and commandments that are sweet to hear. The easy commandments that he promises reward. But there's also the not easy commandments. So we say, and all of them also are precious. Because whether we discern their sweetness, we know intellectually that they are all supremely beneficial. That's my my uh, treatment of those words. And finally, This is my beloved. This is my be my beloved friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. This just takes us right back to all those verses ago that we already forgot existed. Remember the beginning of the chapter. Remember that she was sleeping in bed. Remember that he came to the door knocking and saying, let me in, let me in, let me in. And she had become ensconced in idolatry, uh, adultery in the in the parable. And she was too lazy to get out of bed and walk over to the door and let him in. I don't want to get my feet dirty. I don't want to put my clothing back on. She's giving excuses, excuses, excuses. And finally he leaves. And when she when he leaves, she catches a glimpse of him and she is aroused in repentance and she runs to the door to open. And he's gone, right? And this is the destruction of the temple. And this is the exile, right? And in exile, she's beaten by, by the enemies. She's beaten down. She's downtrodden. And she won't let go of her love for him. And the nations of the world ask her. They say, "What is? how is your love so unique that you are willing to undergo such torture and such torment for the love of this person? We, nations of the world, have no such love for our own deities. But yours is more powerful than anything we've ever seen. Why? What is it about your beloved that makes you so, so irresistibly in love with him? And so she says, he let me count the ways. And that's when she goes describing to the daughters of Jerusalem. Remember, Rashi says the daughters of Jerusalem are the nations of the world. We won't go back to that now, but you have to understand what's happening in this verse. The nations of the world, the daughters of Jerusalem, they ask her, why is your love so strong? And he says, let me describe to you the one that I'm in a relationship with. And she goes through all these verses describing his beauty, his beauty, his beauty, his beauty. Finally, when we get to the end of that description, she says, this is my beloved. This is the one that I love, O daughters of Jerusalem. You ask, and this is my answer. So with this, we, we finish out, we close out her description of the beauty of Hashem. And now I'll just tease you for the next, the next chapter, which will start next week, God willing. Chapter 6 is going to be now the second temple period. The second temple period, because this is during the exile between the destruction of the first temple and the second temple. And they'll be reunited in the second temple, and that'll be the topic of chapter 6. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, Jerry, Reb Yaakov. Uh, you're welcome, Cliff. Anyone who has to go, now you're free to go. Before now, I wouldn't have let you, but now I let you. <laughs>
<laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rabbi. Very nice. I love it. You're welcome. Rabbi Yaakov, did you have a, a comment, a question? I don't hear you, so you have to unmute. He's... Can you hear me now? Now I hear you. Ah, good. Okay, the whole notion of the prohibition on cutting ourselves. Um, when we are in mourning, we cut our clothing. Yes. Is that yes. is that a substitute? Yes, in a certain degree, yes. In other words, it's not like we're trying to substitute the idolatrous practice. But right. the tearing of the clothing is representative, listen to how deep, is representative of the fact that we acknowledge that the body is but a cloak for the soul. And the 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 departure of the soul from the body and now the the demise of the body is only like the demise of a cloak but not of the person itself the person himself is the soul or the person herself is the soul and she lives on what has seen its demise now is the body and so in other words we're doing exactly the opposite when they're tearing the flesh to 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 show their excessive sense of loss over the, the the death of this person and the torah says you're not allowed to do that right and i explained because we believe the soul lives on the way we show that we believe the soul lives on is the tearing of the garment and not the flesh to say this the body is only a garment to the soul the soul was wearing it and now the soul has taken off its garment and has returned to its natural milieu and the soul lives on in infinity okay one more how do we reconcile this whole notion of not cutting with the um the commandment for slaves to put the the all the hole in the ear okay good question i'm gonna give you a simple answer which is on a simple level these things don't seem to be related in other words um okay in other words i'll tell you like you're gonna say we're not allowed to cut the flesh ever but we do circumcise but in other words that it's is in All the right. service of a particular commandment that actually represents perpetuity it doesn't represent the end of life it represents the creation of life in other words the circumcision is, is in i'm i'm just using a parallel example then i'm going to get to your example um is a part of the body that represents continuity because it's it's the reproductive organ right so when we put the covenant in the reproductive organ it's it's our it's our dedication to show that we wish to propagate this relationship with god this covenant with god is for us and our children forever Right, so it's it's called an oath. It's a symbol. It's a sign. It's a sign of an eternal covenant that that carries on uh, uh, through the through all generations. Now, so therefore, it's it's appropriate. But in, even more so, we're to understand, in particular, to the case of circumcision. I know you didn't ask about circumcision, but I don't want to give short shrift. Is good. that Adam was created circumcised, so to speak, meaning the the growth of the foreskin was development after. Um, after s s the, the corruption of the human condition caused the, the covering over of that of that organ, and we're meant to sanctify that organ, so we have to correct the process. Now, um, uh, so it's sort of like it was never supposed to be there in the first place, so all we're doing is restoring, we're restoring the human being to what he was meant to be at first. Now, the, the ear is a compromise granted it's a compromise because ideally first of all the the slave doesn't get his ear pierced for the first six years and right. after six years it's only if he says i wish to i wish to remain a slave to my master which by the way i, I it, it's 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 a big tangent and i don't want to take people's time but it's somewhat worth noting that when we talk about slavery which is a reprehensible institution um and then suddenly we find the Torah condoning slavery. It doesn't in really context. We have to understand that when we use the word slavery referring to what the Torah is talking about versus the 
institution of slavery that was widespread in the world. It's two totally different things. And it just so happens that in Hebrew, we don't have two words, one for servitude and one for slavery. It's the same word. Really, what 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 the so-called slavery, I'm using the English word, not the Hebrew word, that the Torah uh, speaks about is more like indentured servitude. Yes. And it's and it always comes as a corrective. We're not allowed to go around enslaving people. But in the case of the Torah, he was a thief who was caught. He wasn't able to pay his debts. And we're rehabilitating him by allowing him to work off his debt. Or the Torah gives an example of a person who fell on hard times. And so he he sold himself into slavery to, to rehabilitate himself and get himself back on his feet. In both cases, the the goal, the goal of the six-year process, it's not a slave forever. The goal of the six-year process is to rehabilitate this person until he's ready to stand on his own two feet and go back into the world and be a productive member of society. We don't want him to stay. We never wanted him in that position in the first place. It was a compromise to begin with, and the goal is to get him out of it. Now, could you imagine if Jewish slavery was similar to what the the, the hor horrendous institute of, institution of slavery that we are familiar with from history, if it was anything alike, that after six years we would say, now you can go free, and the slave would say, no, I want to, I have to, as Adoni, the Torah says, he says, I have to, as Adoni, I love my master, as Sheshtiva, as Banai, and the wife and children that he's given me, because he's allowed to pair up, he's allowed to make Shidduchim with his male and female slaves and make, mm -hmm. make children with them, and when a slave goes free, he doesn't take his wife with him, the, right. the wife that he had during slavery. Unless, the Torah says, unless he was married when he became a slave. If he was married when he became a slave, the wife he brings into slavery, he takes out of slavery. But if he was single and the husband gave him a shidduch, that was only for the purpose of essentially producing producing offspring that would that would also be slaves. And then and then the husband that's a whole other topic. But but imagine he's saying, I love my I love my master. What, what slave loves his master? I'll tell you what slave loves his master. Because if you had to follow all the laws that the Torah requires of how you treat your slave, your slave would love you. Trust me. Because you have to treat your slave better than yourself. If you have one stake, right? This is the example every Rebbe gives to the kids in class. I learned like this. If you have one stake and then you have porridge, right? Who gets the stake and who gets the porridge? You can't eat steak if your slave isn't eating steak also. Right. If you eat steak, you have to give him steak. If you have one steak, he gets it. If you have one pillow, right? Who sleeps on the floor and who gets the pillow? You can't sleep on a pillow if your slave doesn't have a pillow too. So if if one of you is going to get the pillow, it's going to be him. So the so the the rabbis go so far as to say, Misha Kana Eved, a person who 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 acquires a slave, Kana Adoin he has acquired a master for himself. Yeah. The slave is more the master yes. <laughs> because you're beholden to him in so many ways that he's going to say after six years, I like this. I can get used to this. Can I stay? So in order to show him, the answer is yes, he can. But in order, but we don't want him to. So in order to show him to the degree that we we are disapprove of him remaining a slave, we 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 puncture his ear. We puncture his ear. And Rashi says, why? Because we're, in a certain way, penalizing the ear. He says, this ear that heard at Mount Sinai, I am the Lord your God who took you out of servitude in Egypt. Oh. I am the Lord your God who took you out of servitude. I don't want you to be a slave except to me, meaning a life of, of, of obedience to God. I made you free from Egypt so you could, you could freely live according to the law that I have designed for you. And you wish to put yourself back into servitude to another master? The ear that heard this declaration at Sinai has to be penalized if it doesn't heed the words heed the words that, that I said to it. So we puncture the ear and say, bad boy, bad boy. Ah. Um, so in other words, yes, yes, we don't like the mutilating of flesh. We don't like the puncturing of the ear. But if a person insists on being a slave, we say, well, then you you have some you have a coming to you. You have okay, a coming. Okay, good. That that explains it. Okay, good. I thought that was a simplistic answer, but 
Uh, um, good enough. It's the easiest answer I can offer. Fine. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Any other questions? I'm good. Um, all right, great. So we'll call it a night. Next week, as Ras Hashem, we will begin chapter six. Only three to go. Only three to go. 45 classes in, only three chapters to go. But it's a pretty good track record, to be honest, because if we finish five chapters in less than 50 classes, I know it sounds like it's crazy a lot of a lot of hours. It is. It's, it's, but we're we're averaging less than 10 classes a chapter. Yeah. And we tend to average one verse per class. So if you think of it that way, you know, again, because every verse has so much to gain from it. Why should we why should we short shrift it? So um uh so yeah, that's it. God willing, next week we'll start chapter six. Everybody have a Shavua Tov, a great week. Rabbi, there's, I just have one more comment. Yes. Which is completely off subject. Sure. This is the first time of the year when you should be back in Seattle. Because it's nice weather? It's nice weather and the strawberries are here. You know, we went strawberry picking here in Texas. It's not the same. It's probably not the same. And I'll tell you what also is not the same. The fact that it's 100 degrees and humid. I, listen, I You want to know what else? I'm gonna, I grew I'm gonna up start. in South Florida. I understand. You're right. Hot. Exactly. Exactly. It's like South Florida weather, uh, but it's not as pretty. And right? At least South Florida is beautiful. But here, I'm sorry to all the Houstonians that may, may, I may be offending. But here... I when I moved to to Houston, I said, "Oh, it's so hot." But you know what? I consoled myself and I said, "We'll have air conditioning." I have my air conditioning set to sixty eight degrees in the house, and it won't go below seventy seven because it's a hundred degrees outside. So the oh. best I could do is a high seventies indoors, hmm. and I can handle it. But the Mrs. Mrs. Mallet doesn't handle this well, so it's not good. No. <laughs> Well, she so she said to me, my, my wife. Daughters. Well, she said to me, "Honey, next summer we're we're not staying in Houston. <laughs> we're getting out of Houston next summer. Well, we thought we're good. We have an air conditioner. No, no, no." She said, "Next summer we cannot stay here. <laughs> All right. We'll come to Seattle. Good. I'm saying we neither, but but I may I may come yet. I may come yet. I have some business to uh, attend to over there. Some loose ends to tie up. So." Wonderful. I may be visiting briefly this summer sometime. And keep in mind that by next year, Texas may secede from the country. Right. It's part of the 2023 GOP uh, platform in Texas is uh, to vote on secession. Yeah. So you never know. I may have to, I may need a passport to, to come to Seattle next time. <laughs> I'll be Buy back. her a fan. What's a that? big fan. So buy Mrs. Mollett a fan. Well, we have fans. We have fans. Fans help. <laughs> fans help. But, you know, it's, you can't sit in front of a fan all day either. <laughs> right. If, if, you need, if, if you need someone to vouch for you to come into this, in, in, into Seattle, I'll be glad to do it. We, thank you. We, we, have a, we have a fan. We have a water cooler. We bought a water cooler. So now we have, you know, constant cold water available. We have an ice maker. So we're just... We got these big cups, these big like 16 ounce cups, and we just we fill them with ice and cold water, and we just we just keep you know uh, refrigerating ourselves by drinking ice water all day and running to the bathroom. <laughs> Always a good thing. All righty, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Rabbi. Great class. Bye bye. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.